Okay. Hi there. Peter, are we good up there? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everybody. It was five o'clock, but we say good evening. Um, this is the Portland City Council. We're here for a regularly scheduled council meeting. I want to welcome everybody who's with us in chambers. Welcome to those who are with us on Zoom. We've got 40 attendees at this point in time. Um, I'll call this meeting to order and invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice, for all. and justice for all. And will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Fournier? Here. Councilor Rodriguez? Here. Councilor Dion? Here. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Here. Councilor Trevorrow? Here. Councilor Pelletier is absent. And Councillor Phillips here. And Mayor uh, Snyder. I'm here also. Thank you. Um, and as noted, we do have a couple of councillors who are traveling this evening, but they are with us by Zoom. So Councillor uh, Rodriguez and Councillor Ali, we, we see you listed and we'll see you on the screen if you raise your hand um, and participate. You, you'll be showing here in chambers just so folks know that they can see you that way. Um, we'll head right into the public comment period. So tonight, uh, right now, we'll be taking public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. So you, if you have something to offer um, uh, to the council this evening, please step forward in council chambers to the mic. Um, you'll be given three minutes. Um, on Zoom, please raise your hand, um, and we will now commence the public comment period on items not on tonight's agenda. Okay, I don't see any hands on Zoom. I don't see anybody stepping forward in chambers. And so I'm gonna close public comment period um, this evening. And I'm gonna to look to my colleagues on the council to see if there are any announcements this evening. Okay, it's a quiet start to our meeting. We don't always have that. So we'll head right into recognitions. Um, I, and I have the honor of um, uh, offering us two recognitions uh, this evening. So I'm gonna to look to the clerk just to read the first recognition before us this evening. Recognizing the excellence of Portland's first responders. And I see we have Chief Gautreaux with us in the audience. Thank you for being here. I think you've got some colleagues with you tonight as well, but here is, um, uh, Here's our opportunity to do some honoring um, this evening. On December 28th, 2021, at approximately 3.21 p.m., first responders were dispatched to assist a resident who had suffered an emergency medical event. The Portland Regional Communications Center call taker, Brian Smart, calmly received the emergent request for help while providing support for the family on scene, and dispatcher Patrick Hastings quickly activated the appropriate first responders. Captain Advanced EMT Mark Stewart and fighter, Firefighter Advanced EMTs um, Torin Hultz and Robert White responded in Engine 11 while Firefighter Paramedic Molly Hillman and Firefighter Advanced EMT Jonathan Cronin responded in MedQ4. Portland Fire Department first responders worked together efficiently as a team to perform initial assessments and interventions on scene, carried the patient from the building to the awaiting stretcher and placed them in the back of MedQ4. Paramedic level care was continued during rapid trans transit to Main Medical Center where emergency room, radiology and surgical staff performed life-saving interventions for the patient. The patient was discharged from Main Medical Center on January 1st, 2022, I think that was probably 2023, to return home to be with his family and friends. We are grateful, uh, sorry, I'm gonna, this experience was unique and terrifying for the patient and the patient's family. And we know that this is a daily occurrence for the women and men of the city of Portland Fire Department who respond to these kinds of events every day. Later in our agenda on order 144, we are going to act and we're gonna be honored to act um, on the generosity of the individual whose life our first responders helped to save. Um, 
as we as we honor our firefighters uh, and uh, emergency staff this evening, we want to recognize the generosity that we have before us this evening on our agenda, but we want to send a special recognition and thanks for the work that you all do every single day in response to people who need your help. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Chief Gitro, do you want to step forward? very brief. Um, I think you, you, you said it very correctly. Um, these types of things happen every day and every night in our city. Amazing work that the men and women of my department do, along with Alex Mumford, who's here with the dispatchers, and all, all the calls start there. Uh, and this was just one example of how everything worked perfectly and the system worked. Um, and the outcome was really good. Uh, again, just so proud of all of them. I appreciate the uh, time and the uh, acknowledgement tonight and the recognition. So thank you. Thank you again for yeah. being here. And thank you, Alex, for being here as well. Okay, we are um, pleased to have two recognitions this evening. So will the clerk please read the second recognition? Recognizing the 15th anniversary of Maine Restaurant Week. Okay. Um, again, it's my honor to be able to read this into the record this evening. Um, Maine Restaurant Week is celebrating 15 years. Jillian and Jim Britt started Maine Restaurant Week in 2008 while working with Portland restaurant community legends like Rob Evans at Hugo's, David Turin at David's, Larry Matthews at Back Bay Grill, Jay Villani at Local 188, and many other incredible chefs and owners. Winters have always been tough on restaurants. They're hard on all businesses, but winter's unpredictability presents particular challenges to restaurants. Maine Restaurant Week was born of this winter challenge and was created to provide a boost to owners' bottom lines and also to boost server and bartender income and drive winter business for industry suppliers and beyond. In its 15 years, Maine Restaurant Week has stirred up an estimated $30 million of impact on Portland's and Maine's statewide economy. The concept of Restaurant Week is common. They exist around the country. Maine Restaurant Week was inspired by New York City's Restaurant Week. But Maine Restaurant Week is unique from others in how the, th the, three, in how the three course and tiered menu prices and total flexibility for restaurants of all sizes and configuration, configurations allows the chefs and owners to express their uniqueness. Each March, the 12 days of rest, Maine Restaurant Week are a welcome celebration for dozens of participating restaurants and thousands of customers. Also, Maine Restaurant Week benefits our neighbors through direct financial support for Preble Street. The goal of Maine Restaurant Week is still very much good and relevant. The participating chefs, servers, bartenders, and other, other restaurant staff feel the customer love each March 1 through 12. The business boost to participating restaurants during winter is something everyone can celebrate. As our restaurant community morphs and expands and entertains local food lovers during all seasons and attracts curious food travelers who want to taste what's happening up here in Portland, Maine, our restaurant week has many great years to come. But today we celebrate 15 years of boosting local business during winter. So we send our thanks to Jillian and Jim Britt, who I don't think are here with us tonight, but maybe you're with us on Zoom. And, um, and we send you our special appreciation. Thank you very much. Okay. That is it for recognitions. Again, thanks to everybody who showed up for that. Um, okay. Uh, we're gonna move into the approval of the previous um, meetings minutes. Do I have a motion to approve our February 6th um, draft meeting minutes? Move passage. Second. Second. Councillor Ali from afar, Councillor Zaro right here in chambers. Is there any, any council comment or questions on that motion? Go ahead and vote. Councillor Bornier. Yes. Councillor Rodriguez. Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier is absent. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Yeah. Snyder? Yes. Okay, I am um, just going to note. Oh, here we go. Yep. I was just going to say my Zoom is frozen. So it's very possible we're going to get delayed, not through my computer, but just in general. So sorry, everybody. That's technology. 
Um, those minutes pass unanimously. We are good. Did I vote? Yes. Okie doke. Um, next, we head into appointments. Will the clerk please read order 136? Order 136, 22, 23, appointing members to various boards and committees sponsored by the Legislative and Nominating Committee. Uh, Mayor Kate Snyder, Chair. Uh, a brief comment here. Um, I have the honor this year of chairing the legislative and three of my colleagues on that committee, um, Councilor Fournier, Councilor Ali, Councilor Phillips. Um, and so in when we put on our nominating hat, we uh, meet with people uh, individually one-on-one -on -one and uh, offer interviews for people who are willing to step forward and volunteer on the various boards and commissions that help our city run. So I extend my thanks to my colleagues and to the city clerk who helps um, with staffing that work, that nominating work. Um, and I also wanna send a very big thank you to people in the community who put forward an application who are willing to raise their hand to volunteer for this service. So what's before you on the agenda this evening is the culmination of our most recent meeting, um, a whole lot of uh, interviews and um, uh, nominations we're making for your consideration uh, to these uh, open seats. May I? I'm going to offer you a motion to pass Order 136, and I look for a second. Oh, I just skipped over public comment. Sorry. I'm going to get into the groove just in a second here. Is there any public comment on Order 136? Okay. So if you're in chambers and you'd like to step forward to the mic, please go ahead and do so. I do have one hand up on Zoom. I'm not sure if it's relevant to Order 136 because I've seen it. I saw it shoot up a little bit earlier, but, um, oh, and now it's down. Okay. I don't see additional hands up on Zoom for 136 or in chamber. So I'm gonna close public comment on 136 and I will offer a motion. Um, uh, to appoint these members to various boards and commissions. Can I have a second? Second. second. Councilor Fournier with comment. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Ali. Um, okay, seeing no hands. Oh, Councillor. <laughs> I promise I won't have a lag. Um, I just do have a clarifying question. I think it would be for Corporation Council. I did receive um, inquiry from a constituent who was interested in learning more about uh, former uh, municipal or school uh, staff. Um, that would be appointed to one of these boards if there's a conflict of interest. Question. Me too, Peter. I'm I'm not yeah, I'm not connecting either. Could we be having disruption? Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um and it may not So we're, try we're trying to work through those right now. So just give us a minute. Um, I think it is something that's beyond just our uh, internet here. I think it's something uh, to do with Zoom itself. Uh, so we'll try to see if we can figure this out and get moving.
Jessica says, Okay. Um, thank you for that. So I, I, I think we're, we're back to being connected. Um, and I, I beg your patience with the fact that I seem to be managing multiple screens here and the in-person meeting. So thanks for your patience. I don't see hands up on Zoom. I don't want to blow through public comment, um, but I, I didn't see any hands up before we're, we, were, we were back in action. I don't see any now. We're in the midst of questions about Order 136. Councilor Zaro, are you all set on that front? Okay, so we'll go ahead and, and pick up where we left off. Sorry for the pause, everybody. We are having some difficulties with Zoom. Oh, we're frozen again. Okay, okay, any other council discussion on order 136? Okay, and I don't see any from my colleagues who are with us on Zoom, so we'll go ahead and vote to approve order 136, please. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier is absent. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 136 passes unanimously. I'm recalling the early days of Zoom when I would say, let's all show up with a lot of patience and a good sense of humor. Let's do that again. Um, <laughs> will the clerk please read order 137? For 137, 22, 23, appointing Troy Moon to the Pest Management Advisory Committee sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. And we'll look to the city manager for comment on this item. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I believe Troy is uh, here in the in the audience, um, but he is our sustainability director. He's the perfect appointment for this position, and therefore we are recommending his appointment this evening. Thank you for that. He is with us on the attendee side. I don't know if there will be any questions for him, but if there are, we can certainly bring him over. In the meantime, is there any public comment on Order 137? Okay. I don't see any in person or on Zoom. I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second, Council. Councillor Zara with a second from Councillor Fournier. Are there any questions or comments from the council? I see none. We can go ahead and vote on order 137. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 137 passes unanimously. I see Troy Moon here with us over on the attendee side. Thanks for being here. Troy, do you have anything you want to offer? Um, nope. Thank you for appointment. Okay, great. Thank you for, for, for your willingness and for being here this evening. Will the clerk please read order? We're heading into licenses. Will the clerk please read order 138? Order 138-22-23, granting municipal officers approval of the application for Volcano. It's for indoor entertainment at 155 Riverside Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on Order 138? I see none. I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Councilor Ali with an absolute tie. I'm giving it to Councilor Fournier. Thank you. Council discussion on order 138. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. 138 passes unanimously. And if the owners of Volcano are here with us in person or on Zoom, I want to take a minute to thank you very much for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read order 139. Order 139, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of bread and friends, applications for class three and four food service establishment with outdoor dining uh, located on public property at, four, at 505 4th Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on order 139? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. So moved. Second. Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Zaro. 
Any questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 139 passes unanimously. And if the owners of Bread and Friends are here with us this evening, we would like to thank you for your attendance and certainly thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Next, will the clerk please read order 140. 140, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Portland Sea Dogs. Application is for Civic Auditorium with Combined Entertainment located at 271 Park Ave, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you, and we'll take public comment on order 140. Uh, George Rowe, uh, Hanover Street. Um, I was just curious, um, in a way, this is almost like a co-application with the city of Portland because you guys are the, the landlords. Um, the public um, nominally owns Hadlock Field. Actually, I think we own a lot of it because we spend a lot of money maintaining it. But um, I wanted to understand whether there's a percentage of the sales that goes to the city. I have no idea what the contract with the Sea Dogs is. It was done, you know, Probably it's been updated, but it was originally from like 94 or something like that. So I have no idea whether any of us have seen it in the last, uh, you know, this millennium. But anyway, um, I'm just curious what percentage of sales um, the city might be entitled to on a gross or a net basis, whatever, because obviously the city has an interest in that license doing pretty much whatever it wants to do. Um, not to say that there's, you know, uh, you know, loud, raucous behavior out on the ball field that we're looking the other way on. But I think it's important for us to understand when the city has a direct interest in an applicant that, you know, we're aware of it. Um, and of course, you know, the, during the Payson Park Music Festival brouhaha just a few months ago, everyone was all worried about, you know, private business making money on public property. And we always seem to sort of look the other way when America's pastime is involved. <laughs> um, I think the average price of a major league franchise right now is north of $2 billion. So major league baseball, which obviously a minor league team is part of that ecosystem, is an enormously profitable business that rakes in billions and billions of dollars. And I think it's important for our community to understand where we fit into that as basically giving them the platform to make their money. And I think it's important for us to make sure that we're getting at least some benefit, if not at least breaking even in that relationship, especially if we're spending money replacing floodlights and sidewalks and all the other things that we often uh, either share the cost for or outright pay for, and then just gets folded into the lease with the sea dog. So I hope that's on your list of questions tonight. If, uh, if, they, if it isn't, um, please indulge me. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I'm gonna pause here for a second. I don't have any internet. Um, you? I know, but I can't take public comment unless I can see it. Hmm. I have a public. Not chambers. Mm -hmm. I think I have it. Okay. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Rowe. Sorry about that. Um, is there any other public comment on Order 140? Okay, I don't see any on Zoom or in chamber, so I'm gonna close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. Move okay. passage. Second. Councilor Zaro, second from Councilor Fournier. And now we have an opportunity to discuss uh, this application that's before us this evening. Are there any questions from the council? Well, knowing that the contract is probably pretty fresh in our corporation council's uh, mind, I wonder if you would be willing to talk a little bit about how uh, the contract speaks to things like concessions and other opportunities that the Sea Dogs has if you're able to do so. Yeah, it's. I mean, the the, the uh, lease is a public document. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm looking at, I'm looking at Ethan over here um, who's shaking his head. He doesn't also not know. I don't believe that we have a, we, we don't. 
Yeah, we do not have a, a, a percentage of sales. We do not receive a percentage of sales from concessions. That was my understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Other questions from the council? Council discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes, order 140 passes unanimously. Um, it is not usually like this. Uh, I don't have any internet right now. Um, so if you will just bear with me. I could, we could do the meeting without me having internet, but for public comment. Okay. I can use my um, I can use my phone. I think. Let's try it one more time. Um, okay. So we'll give this another go. Um, and if I freeze up again, I will rely on others to help me know whether or not we've got some hands raised on the attendee side. Um, okay, we are now heading out of, um, before I do so, I wanna say thank you to the Sea Dogs for doing business in the city of Portland. Uh, will the clerk please read communication 24. Communication 24, 22, 23, regarding the Sustainable Neighborhood Pilot Program, sponsored by Troy Moon, Sustainability Director. Wonderful, and we see Troy Moon is here with us. So Troy, you've got the floor to present this item before the council tonight, except for you're muted. There, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we are really excited to announce uh, this new program, the uh, Sustainable Neighborhood Program. Uh, it's an idea that came out of uh, the One Climate Future Climate Action Plan, and our goal is to help residents become part of um, helping you know, Portland become a resilient, low carbon community. Um, the plan calls for um, you know, promoting actions in neighborhoods that promote social resilience. We know that uh, neighborhoods where neighbors work together and know each other and, and interact together are more successful in terms of resilience in the face of you know, climate change or, or emergencies. And so our program is, is, is designed to encourage more participation and encourage neighbors, um, broad, uh, the broad cross section of neighborhoods to get to know each other better and work together. So we're doing, so we're gonna organize this program. We're gonna invite two uh, neighborhoods this year to uh, become the pilot neighborhoods. And we hopefully will expand this to, you know, the rest of the, the, the city as years go on. Um, but we will provide support to groups and communities who want to do things like host home weatherization workshops with their neighbors or organize uh, neighborhood street cleanups, um, recruit volunteers to help each other take care of their yard work and, and snow shoveling, um, maybe host a canning and pickling workshop or teach, you know, help each other have organic um, lawns. But the idea is really that the Neighborhoods that participate um, self-select the programs that are meaningful to them. And then um, my team in the sustainability office will help um, gather resources for people, help help the community groups organize themselves, do some outreach to each other, uh, maybe get, get some help from other departments who might have resources like public work works, picking up some trash after a cleanup, or maybe the community members want to do um, a nutrition workshop and we can coordinate with public health. Well, that's what our team will help, you know, help them organize, help the neighborhoods organize that, that work. Um, so we're going to select um, the, uh, the application period opens on March 3rd. Um, we'll have a month um, of working with neighborhoods to help them get applications together. Um, we have a workshop on Thursday this e this week um, to talk more about the program to interested citizens. Um, and then as you know, as the program un unfolds over the course of the year, um, the neighborhoods that are working together will earn points. Um, and after they accumulate enough points, we'll designate them as, you know, 
has you know designated sustainable neighborhoods and hopefully develop community pride and um, and get some recognition from from the city and from the council and the mayor perhaps. Um, but this program has been really successful in Colorado. We got this idea from my colleague in Lakewood, Colorado, and have had great success. And several cities in, in Colorado are now doing a program very similar to this, and we're learning a lot from them. Um, but we're really excited to bring this here. I think um, we've gotten a lot of feedback and um, interest from neighborhood organizations so far and, and residents. So people who are interested don't necessarily have to belong to an organized neighborhood organization. We invite them to reach out to our office. Um, if we went to the sustainability webpage, there's a link there to learn more about it. And uh, we're really excited to, uh, to get this program rolling. Thank you very much, Director Moon. We appreciate that presentation and um, uh, the communication that's in our packet um, and the fact that you're here. Um, as this is a communication, it requires no public comment or council action, but if there are any counselors who have any questions for Director Moon, now would be the time. But this is a program that um, he'll be administering and so you can reach out to him anytime. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, will the clerk please read communication 25? Communication 25, 22, 23, update regarding asylees in Portland, uh, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Um, as, as everyone knows, uh, and you saw in the backup material, the city has been uh, working to, to find accommodations and housing for um, numerous unhoused individuals within the city that includes a significant number of asylum seekers. Um, and right now I'm just providing you all with an update of those current numbers since uh, January 1st, uh, 2023, just this year. We've had um, 550 plus individuals um, who've arrived and needed uh, care and shelter. Um, that's over 80 uh, individuals each week. And um, the staff has been doing an, an enormous amount of work and a great job making sure that all of those people have been um, safely housed and received all the services, food, shelter, and et cetera that they need. Um, we're doing that currently at a variety of locations throughout the city, uh, specifically um, at our Oxford Street shelter, which has a capacity of 154 people, um, as well as our family shelter, um, a warming space, and um, a Portland Public Schools gym. Um, and then we are still uh, in uh, right now operating out of one hotel that we're uh, slowly taking offline. So you know, roughly about a thousand plus people that we're currently housing within the city on a nightly basis and taking care of. Um, that is a, a significant increase from what we've uh, had um, in many years in the past. And um, it's taxing us uh, significantly in terms of making sure that we can continue to do that. Um, I, uh, I am very worried that we're nearing capacity. Um, that warming shelter space um, is, is not ideal. It, it requires uh, that we have, in order to house everyone, that we use um, chairs uh, in a lot of situations to have people um, with their families uh, sitting uh, as they try to sleep at night um, so that we can house as many people as possible. And that... Um, that situation is becoming untenable. And we are obviously seeking uh, broad and systemic solutions to this uh, very significant issue. Uh, we, uh, through the legislative and nominating committee and with our delegation have been pursuing many legislative changes to the general assistance program, as well as um, seeking a coordinated response from the state, which we've continually advocated for, which would be specifically to have a, um, you know, an office that would be uh, coordinating all of this with all of our regional uh, municipalities, as well as ensuring that we know exactly the numbers of people that we're serving, making sure all the services are being provided. Um, because I would note that's these numbers are just the numbers that the city of Portland is receiving. Our um, neighboring communities are also receiving individuals. So it's a significant influx of people to manage and make sure that we're, we're caring for everyone and no one's falling through the cracks. So we'll continue to advocate for that 
this legislative session, we have numerous bills that are in through our legislative delegation that would address a lot of those issues. Um, we're hopeful that we'll see some changes there. Additionally, at the federal level, we're seeking um, with our federal delegation a change to the work authorization period that would also help. Um, we continue to, to advocate for that strong need um, and hope that that will actually come to fruition. Um, and then lastly, we've really been working on trying to address this transitional housing need um, that the first sort of step in this process when people arrive is making sure that you have shelter for them. And that's with that transitional or emergency housing piece. And that's sort of the missing link here. Um, obviously, there's there's several things that need to happen beyond that permanent housing as well. Um, but that initial transitional housing, we're really trying to work on and address the need for that. We've been working with the state. They've put a significant amount of money into main state housing um, to administer. Uh, there's a lot of um, ability there. If there are community partners that are able to step up and find open space um, and able to you know, help in this regard to help us with this capacity, because my biggest fear, if anybody read the, the newspaper yesterday, is we have a significant staffing shortage uh, in the city of Portland. And so not only do we not have enough space, but we're running out of staff to be able to continue to meet this need. And so we really do need help. Um, and we do need help from all of the governmental partners I mentioned, the feds and the state, but also from our community partners to help address a, you know, significant needs, quite honestly, like this past weekend with the cold that we experienced. And we were lucky enough um, to have a church step up and fill that need and address that because we had over 50 individuals who accessed those services when it was brutally cold. And we need that help. We continually need that help. Um, and I think, uh, and I worry that we're going to need more help. So we're just an update to let you know where we are, to let you know that I continue to try to seek and find uh, solutions to this, working with the state and many other people. Um, and staff continues to do the best job it can with what it has in terms of resources. But um, I fear that the you know, unfortunately, that potentially the cliff may be coming where we aren't going to be able to meet the need. We're trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, but that's my my biggest fear. So we'll continue to to keep you updated. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, thank you, manager. Um, as this is a communication, it's not an opportunity for public comment or council action, but if there are any questions or comments from the council, happy to take those at this time. Councilor Fournier. Thank you, not, not a lot of questions because I know <laughs> we've been chasing this for a while, but really just, um, more gratitude for our city staff and for our community partners who have stepped up. We can't do this on our own. Obviously, we've been trying. Um, and so just in recognition, we have so many community partners out there who are working together through mutual aid, through peer services to just try and find and fill these shelter needs. Um, and so just really, I can't underscore writing letters to our congressional delegation, continuing to stay in touch with our state delegation, continuing to request support from the governor. We need help. We can't continue to do this. Um, and it comes together as we see these cold weekends, we start to see the flurry of emails and um, social media messages that are tagging us and saying, help, help, help. We don't know where people are going to sleep and we don't either. And I think that's really, really hard and heartbreaking for all of us because we, you know, we are the leaders in this city and we feel, I think, very strongly about providing support and making sure that everyone has safe and sustainable housing. And when we can't do that, that hurts, I think, for all of us. And so I just want um, everyone to know we desperately care and we are really trying to find support and help. Um, there are no great solutions without statewide coordination and partnership. So really the best way that you can help us is by using your voice to make sure that this is heard um, in Augusta and in DC. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I have a hand up on Zoom from Councillor Ali, who's with us. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm turning off my camera because my internet is kind of like uh, slow. Um, I want to add to what my colleague, Councillor Fonia, just uh, 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 said. I, um, I think in yesterday or today's newspaper, I saw that the city of South Portland have also approved uh, 
the building of uh, different sizes of shelters across the city of South Portland. I want to show my gratitude for them to do that because that uh, goes directly into what my colleague, Councillor Fonia, is saying that we cannot do it alone. And I hope that uh, some of our other neighbors in the greater Portland area will also look into doing that so that um, some of the pressure that is on the city of South, city of Portland will ease uh, by getting people um, from across uh, the region, uh, some sort of like help finding housing um, in different places and locations, uh, not just in Portland. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wanna thank the mayor and all the city staff who work on this issue day in and day out. And it, it really bothers me as an individual counselor when I receive emails from the public that somehow they feel free to criticize and downgrade our efforts. Like we don't give a damn, we do. I admire the mayor and the city manager because they have the position that requires them to be professionally polite, but I'd like to say something directly. I've had it with that attitude among certain citizens. It's disrespectful to the compassion and the integrity of our staff and their ability to try to meet this challenge. I also fear we're entering a phase of fatigue. I don't know what it's like to work on HHS and every day you gotta get up and there's no hope that it's gonna be done. It gets worse. I mean, 80 people a day, imagine if that arrived at a school or your home, that just the bus pulls up with 80 and it comes every single day and somehow we're supposed to just incorporate that humanity into our community without any problem. It's almost invisible to too many of our residents, all right? So I'm gonna call it, I'm calling the governor to do something. I think your efforts at the legislative level are great. The legislation is a path of incremental steps. It's great to address a condition. We are a point of criticality. The manager is talking about a cliff. You know what that cliff's gonna look like? People out on the street. That cliff is gonna look like people being housed in conditions that you and I would reject. That's what criticality is gonna look like. You know, so I appreciate the efforts of the legislative. I appreciate the federal government. Although I don't ever wait for Washington to save me from anything. All right. Augusta is going to move to make policy. But we need resources now. We don't need money like we need space. We need staff. If other communities can help, if agencies can help, we need human beings, just like our staff, to be on the ground to help manage this issue, all right? And we can't wait for the manager to take the heat from the public. You haven't done anything, it's cold. Where are the warming centers? You don't think she gets up every day thinking about that? She does. You don't think, I, I see you, Mr. Rowe, okay? And I'll, I'll exercise some decorum and not react to your negativity, but I do put it on the record. Okay, people are trying to get the job done. So I asked the governor to appoint somebody to act as triage for Cumberland and York counties to deal with this, to coordinate the beds, to reach out in an affirmative way to organizations that might have space. We can't wait and hope that they show up. All right, we're beyond that now. Or we're gonna see consequences that none of us are gonna like. And I'm here to say today, that this council will defend the administration and their ability to respond to that. It's not their fault. They've done everything they can do. We need to do more. We need the public to step up. Sometimes you gotta join the fight. You can't just read about it in the newspaper. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Dion. Um, I'll, I'll weigh in. So uh, I, I know the manager does wake up every day thinking about this, whether the forecast is gonna be four degrees or 40 degrees. The fact is we're getting people to the city of Portland in numbers that are incompatible with our facility capacity and our budget. So like every organization, 
we do our best to articulate our policy goals through our budget. And as we enter the FY24 budget building process, we're gonna be talking a lot about the new Homeless Services Center and how we intend as a municipality to respond to our state's general assistance law. Portland is not at all unique. We have an obligation to respond to the state's general assistance law like every other town and city in the state of Maine. We have opted to run municipal shelters, both for families and individuals. Not every community does that, we do. We budget for it. As the manager said, we've got 154 beds at Oxford Street, Street and we've got a similar number of beds through our family shelter. Those are the facilities that we pay for, we staff for. When we go beyond that, which we always do, we elasticize our budget and our intentions with hotels, with warming centers, with gymnasiums. And what I beg people to realize is that none of us know everything. And our, con our context is constantly changing. So when we budgeted in FY23 for what we thought was, a, was our municipality's response to the general obligation, general assistance obligation, we didn't know what was coming our way. We were not able to, ant to anticipate the number of asylum seekers that would be coming to the state of Maine. So the city of Portland has been incredibly elastic within the confines of the budget. And that's the reality. So when, when we, when we look into FY24 and we make our biggest policy decisions through that budget document, we will be articulating to our community what we can do and what we look to our community to help fund. When our manager talks about the need for different kinds of housing, I think it's really important to say again, we need emergency shelter right now. Permanent housing is important. Transitional housing is important, but what we were faced with on Friday, Friday night and Saturday night was the need for emergency shelter. And I fear that people think that because the city owns buildings, we have limitless capacity. I get emails saying, you own tons of buildings, open them. You have to staff them. We have to have staff that's trained to work with populations that need help. And volunteers can be useful, but it's not a flip of the switch. Um, so we have to be really realistic and thoughtful about what the needs are. Right now we are, as Councillor Dion said, at a critical junction. Our job is to make very, very plain that we are at a cliff and we don't have everything we need to respond to the needs in, of the community. And thank goodness we do have community partners that step forward. But lots of times those community partners are looking to us to expand the capacity. And it's only at the 11th hour that we're able to pull it together. And I thank my lucky stars. I, I, I woke up on Saturday morning thinking, is everybody okay? Right. And, and we had been in contact all through the days and all, you know, all through the, 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 the process. Um, as my colleagues say, nobody up here doesn't wake up thinking about these things and go to bed thinking about these things. And we care passionately. And our job is to use our voice, to inform our community, to inform one another, to inform our, our delegation that goes to Augusta, to inform the region, uh, to inform the governor, right? And we are doing that. And we have been doing that in this ever-changing landscape since March of 2020. So I would say we are at the cliff because every single time the temperature dips, we are wondering how we're gonna make sure that people are not freezing overnight. And at this point, it's not even about beds. It's about chairs in a warm facility that has adequate staff to be there with people. So I beg people's um, engagement. I beg your voice in Augusta. I want you to pay attention to our budget process. I want you to work with us to understand what it means to provide emergency shelter in response to the general assistance law and work with us to understand what is it that Portland's doing to meet that need. I think we do a very good job in an ever-changing landscape. Other comments? Okay, thank you so much for that communication. Uh, we head now into unfinished business. Will the clerk please read order 135? Order 135, 22, 23, approving the purchase and sale agreement with the Trust for Public Land for North Deering Park, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Uh, I look to the city manager for context here. 
Uh, certainly, I see the director of Parks, Recs, and Facilities, Ethan Hipple. He will uh, provide some background information on this item. Great, thank you. I'm also inviting up here Phil Doobie, who's our project partner with the Trust for Public Land. He's going to have some words after I'm done uh, introducing this. So good evening, everybody. Ethan Hipple, Director of Parks, Rec, and Facilities Department. Um, we're bringing uh, this item to you. This is the fourth time it's been to the council. So we've had a lot of uh, discussion of this, but this is around our North Deering Park project um, to create a new park in the city of Portland. So it's a generational opportunity, uh, 24 acres of property uh, that includes a lot of open space, but also a developed um, baseball, a privately owned uh, athletic field. Um, that'll be uh, really useful to the city of Portland. Um, I just want to talk briefly about this uh, before I introduce Phil. Um, this project accomplishes, uh, you know, a lot of council and department priorities um, for us that I think are important to point out as we've, you know, gotten some public comment on this, uh, this project, supportive and, uh, and, and folks asking questions or, uh, yeah. Uh, this neighborhood, um, I guess one of the first priorities that this addresses is equitable, equitable access to parks and open space. Um, we think this is a really important uh, piece of this project and something we've been working with uh, the Trust for Public Land on a lot. 25% of the direct neighborhood is uh, considered low income. Uh, this is within walking distance of Lyseth Elementary School and Lyman Moore Middle School. Lyseth uh, Thirty-two percent of the kids at Lyseth uh, are qualify for free or reduced lunch, and fifty-five percent of the kids at Lyman Moore um, qualify for free or do reduced lunch. Those kids are going to be able to walk to this park, and this is going to be outdoor education, access to nature, maybe something they don't have within walking distance of them right now. So for us, that's huge, um, and we've got some great support from the school district and letters from the principals. Um, about their plans to use this uh, new green space. Um, we've got a low, low, we've got a lot of existing low and uh, moderate income housing uh, within a mile of this property already on Auburn Street. And there's also uh, Project Lambert Woods, with, which is also under a mile from this uh, project. That's workforce housing that's um, going to be underway shortly this spring. Um, and so for that reason, you know, it's, this is providing that green space to people of all income levels in Portland. Um, there are some who maybe try to paint uh, the acquisition or development of open space and green space as, as the enemy of uh, affordable housing. And I'm the Parks and Recreation Director. That is definitely uh, my mission is to help provide those opportunities and access to all Portlanders. But I don't work in a vacuum. I work with other city departments that are concerned with um, provide, you know, developing housing uh, within our planning department, within housing and economic development. It's a huge city priority, and I'm part of that fabric and uh, of the work we do. Um, and we work together with them to identify opportunities for that. Um, and uh, and we've got a lot of a track record of uh, making a lot of properties available for that development. This space in particular is prime for open space development. It's got an existing athletic field on it, which means we don't have to cut down a tree uh, to create an athletic field, which we desperately need. And our kids uh, and adults uh, who uh, play sports really need access to. Um, in 2011, the city did uh, an uh, athletic facilities task force. Uh, members of the city council sat on that, community members. Um, and through that, they discovered that we don't have adequate athletic facility space. So this is our soccer fields, softball, baseball, you name it. The recommendation was to add more. We haven't added more. Here's an opportunity to add more. Uh, we currently borrow field space. We rent field space because uh, we don't have enough field space for our kids to use. Um, so I have two locations uh, in the past few years where we've lost access to that borrowed space because those property owners are um, developing their own properties for housing for seniors or housing for students, et cetera. And so those are no longer available to us so that uh, it makes it all the more important um, from a department perspective uh, to acquire this. Um, 
And yeah, so tonight is a huge opportunity. We brought this uh, before for acceptance of grants, federal grants that are going towards this project, land bank funds that will go towards this project, as well as a state grant that we got. So this item before you is the actual purchase and sale agreement. It's with the Trust for Public Land. And so I'll introduce Phil Duby, who we've been working hand in hand on this throughout. And uh, he can talk more about Phil Trust for Public Land's role in this and any questions you might have. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Duby, and I'm a Portland resident. And I am also a project lead at the Trust for Public Land. Uh, firstly, a big hearty thank you for the opportunity to talk about parks and access to outdoor space for all. In the soon to be near it, uh, in the soon to be newest park uh, in the city of Portland, the North Deering Park, the Trust for Public Land and the city of Portland have a long and strong friendship that spans decades. TPL's first ever project in Maine was right here in Portland, the Eastern Prom in 1993. I was one year old. Um, the city and TPL have gone on to add Kanko Woods, uh, the Bayside Trail, and now the North Deering Park to the Portland Park system. We're going to show uh, a two minute video in a couple seconds that speaks to TPL's mission, our 50th birthday, which is this year, our values and work. This video embodies the decades old friendship between the city of Portland and the Trust for Public Land which is based on our shared belief in the transformative power of communities' access to outdoor space. North Deering Park will be the largest addition to the Portland Park system in a generation. Uh, in this project, uh, and, and, and this project epitomizes the relationship or the friendship that exists between uh, TPL and the city of Portland and our shared values. With that, I think we'll watch the video. I didn't know we had a video, but thank you very much for that. Yeah, and uh, I'll just say we're both available for questions if you have them. So. Great. Uh, Director Hippel, Mr. Duby, thank you both for being here with us, and we will look to you for questions if there are any. Um, but first, what we're going to do is see if there's any public comment on Order 135. So if you'd like to offer comment here in chambers, come, um, come up to the mic. And if you are on Zoom with us, happy to take your uh, comment. Uh, we'll start in chambers. 
Um, and then we'll toggle back and forth like we usually do. So why don't you, if you're here to speak, come on forward, give us your name and uh, neighborhood you live in or the organization that you represent and we'll give you three minutes on the clock. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Snyder and other councilors. Uh, John Cashmar, I'm here on behalf of the Land Bank as a commissioner, and I'm also a joint uh, appointee to the Parks Commission. I have the honor of serving on both, which I enjoy. I wanted to speak in favor um, of North Deering Park, the Land Bank. Um, as you know, you prior, uh, previously uh, blessed our $80,000, which we put towards this project from our CIP allocation. Um, we're very excited about it. It's an extraordinary opportunity of 24 acres in the city, um, the place where park is needed, and some of that will go into the land bank, the more wild parts of it. It's a unique project having uh, established ball fields, um, seven acres of incredible forested land, and really a special opportunity. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. Okay, we'll hop over to Zoom, and we have Stephen Bond. Stephen, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. I think we are going to pause on Stephen um, and we'll come back to the council and then head over to Zoom again. Uh, go ahead and uh, you're free to address the council, uh, Mr. Rowe. Uh, George Rowe, uh, Hanover Street. Um, I had asked the council via email to. Uh, give a special ad hoc committee of the council um, an opportunity to have a full public meeting uh, for the whole city um, to uh, hear from both sides about the actual equity um, accounting that's going on with this park proposal. And I did that partly because the council itself in December uh, with resolve number five said that that's what they're going to do uh, from now on when there are big things in front of you is to dive deep on how actual things before you are affecting things like uh, claims about diversity, inclusion, and uh, equitable treatment of everybody in the city. And the thing that is most bothersome about this project from the beginning is that it hinges on the federal government, our friends in Washington, who apparently on this matter, we can count on because they're giving us something in the range of $400,000. And that entire slug of money depends on a low-income disadvantaged park program run by the federal government that is supposed to give priority to communities of disadvantaged folks, residents, with 20% more poverty levels. This neighborhood, if you look at the actual census tract, this is facts, people. The census tract, the United States census, you can look it up on a website right now, says that this neighborhood has 5.5% as of the most recent accounting, low-income people. And you know why the federal government doesn't kick this application to the can to the curb? Because it says that it has to give priority to those applications. But if a city like Portland doesn't even bother to submit an application to benefit neighborhoods with 20% or more low income and disadvantaged members, then they don't have to give priority. There's only one application. They can just wave it on through, which is pretty much what they did here. That's how we got $400,000 from Washington. We, we gamed it. We gamed the system. And this council I've asked literally for years to look closely on the, on the claims here. And the fact is, there is a 10 plus acre parcel right near the North Deering Gardens apartments. And it's sat there since 1996 under city ownership. Did the Trust for Public Land ever bring that to the land bank? Did the land bank ever bring that to you? Did the city parks department ever bring it to anybody? I don't know. It never came up in the last three years. It's never come up in the seven years I've lived in Portland. That place would be equitable, not this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. And I'll go back to Zoom. Stephen Bond, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Yep, go ahead. Okay, I appreciate it. I was just wondering, you know, you, you guys Steven, are saying that. Excuse me, can you start with your name um, and also the name? Yeah, my name is Steven. 
Stephen Stephen Bond. And then if you can give us either your neighborhood or the organization that you represent. No, no organization. Or the neighborhood you live in. And, in uh, I live in Portland. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, you guys are saying that, you know, there's something like 80 people a day, migrants coming in. There's only about 30 births a day in the entire state of Maine. So Mr. Mr. Bond, you know, I was right just now, wondering. Right now we're talking about order 135 on the council agenda. Yeah, you guys passed this topic up. Well, I that assume was a you guys don't want to talk about it for well, personal we reasons. We don't take public comment on a communication. Thank you though. And if yeah, you want okay. to comment on order 135, that- I would just say, look into where these migrants are coming from and who's funding it. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move to Nan coming on Zoom. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, um, I'm Nan Cumming. I'm the executive director of the Portland Parks Conservancy. Um, and I'm speaking tonight to enthusiastically endorse the city's acquisition of these 24 acres in the heart of North Deering. Um, as many of you know, the Portland Parks Conservancy is a private nonprofit. We were founded in 2018. And our mission is to support the public parks and recreational programs of Portland. Our board of trustees identifies the projects we support based on our organizational values. And our most important value is park equity. And that's what led us to select North Deering Park as one of our priority projects in 2023. Um, as you already heard from Ethan and Phil, North Deering is home to many low income residents who depend on local green space for recreation. But North Deering is also one of the last remaining gaps in the city's quest to provide park access within a 10 minute walk of every home in Portland. That's why the Portland Parks Conservancy is partnering with the Trust for Public Land to help raise the funds for the land's acquisition and preservation. Given the rapid growth of Portland within the last several years, it is amazing to me that this land has remained undeveloped and it's an opportunity that will not come again. We are committed to this project and excited about our partnership with the city to create this important new public park for the people of Portland. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Is there anybody else in chambers who would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll go back to Zoom. Uh, Katie West. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, I'm Katie West and I am the Outdoor and Experiential Learning Coordinator for the Portland Public Schools um, and a former teacher at Lyseth, which is a school that is in proximity to this um, proposed park. And I want to speak simply and passionately in support of um, this proposal. Um, and I speak also with an awareness of earlier conversations that, that space is limited and demand uh, in demand. And I just urge you for the sake of the children, the animals and the species that help us keep a critical balance in our fragile city ecosystem to, um, to be in support of this park because we know a few things. One, that studies show strongly that childhood experiences in nature have a significant impact on what we call PEB or pro-environmental behaviors. And so up to, you know, adults, um, you know, 80% of adults who can say, who are surveyed that consider themselves conservationists attribute it to their childhood experiences which in which they had a proximity to nature. We also know that 86% of families of color in Maine um, are in nature deprived areas and 26% of white families are in nature deprived areas. And we know that just access to green space can have such a powerful effect on our mental um, health and it can even improve our life expectancy by 12%. Um, and North Deering Park will allow students to engage in walking field trips from Lysa, where I used to teach, and Lyman Moore, so that they can learn more about the organisms and habitat over time and deepen their understanding of how to value and protect green spaces, um, and also be future citizens of this community, um, because we are really going to need children who become adults who understand environmental literacy and the interconnectedness of life. Um, and just additionally, recognizing the species that are there, we are in an incredible insect apocalypse. Um, people are calling it which upwards of 50% of insects have disappeared. So we really need to have the intelligence to preserve any green spaces we have within the city, um, as well as 
just for those of you that know that big night is coming up and that's when salamanders that live 20 to 30 years travel miles to get to vernal pools such as Baxter Woods as such as one that's also in this North Deering Park. Um, and I just wanna encourage you each to think of your childhood and a special place that you might've gone outdoors. And if you had private land, wonderful. 30 second warning. And if you were like me who totally depended on public space for the natural world connection and ironically mine growing up included a baseball field. I mean, it wasn't much to look at but it completely guided my life, my profession and a connection to the earth that I hope to inspire with the students. And this park would help make that possible for educators in the area. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody in chambers want to step forward? Okay, I'll go back to Zoom, Josh Hawking. Josh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, my name's Josh. I work at the Portland Public Library, District 4. And I just wanna say that I support this um, action. Um, I also want to say there is no climate change. Diversity is code for anti-white. There are only two genders. I hate the antichrist. I'm never okay, taking- Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well-regulated America, well-regulated America. Comment, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Okie doke. I see no other hands up. I don't see anybody stepping forward in council chamber. So I'm going to close public comment on order 135 and look to the council for a motion, please. Move, Percy. So uh, Councillor Ali, I'm going to give you the second, Councillor Dion. Thank you. I tried. Thank you so much. I really Any tried. Council discussion on Order 135. Councillor Fournier. Thank you. I just wanted to share this is um, uh, my neighborhood, actually, is just a little bit farther. My kids went to Lyseth, Lyman, Moore, and now currently go to Casco Bay. So this is definitely where we've been since 2006. Um, I can, I, you, we've heard us say over and over again, we really want housing. My understanding of this particular project is the conditions were that it be public land. And, um, you know, I am fully in support of the parks, but I wanna go back to the point around the census data because working um, in the population that I work with, with indigenous people, both historically black indigenous and disadvantaged people have been undercounted and miscounted in the census. And so anecdotally from living in this area since 2006, having my children go to these schools, I can tell you they are um, incredibly diverse. There are many, many families that are um, immigrant asylum seeking resettled that are living in these neighborhoods that need access to the space. So I'm very proud that we're doing this. Again, I know we need housing and we will go over that over and over and over again. Um, but this specific project, I believe was not intended to ever be made available for housing. It was, it is a park or it is private space. Um, and so I'm glad that we are able to add a park um, for these families that live in that area, including my family. Um, but I will continue to underscore um, for the land bank and for um, our parks and for our planning department as these come up in this next year, I really hope we are looking from start to finish um, how we can make these available for housing. Um, that, as we're saying, we're kind of closing the gap on the final area of the city that needs this open space. And so my hope is now, okay, if any other land comes up, we're really looking at that for housing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Diane, did you hand up? I did. I'm going to vote in the affirmative on this. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, it's in my district. It's walking distance from my home. Maybe I get to take my four grandkids there. Um, they live in an urban environment. So they, they find green space and trees something really awesome from their point of view when all they see are buildings and freeways. So I think it makes good sense for the neighborhood. I concur with the observations made by Councillor Fournier. Um, I live in what had historically been a Caucasian neighborhood. The face of my neighborhood has changed dramatically and it's all kids going to Lysa now and their families don't look anything like mine. So I don't know whether or not they were incorporated into the census, who knows. Uh, but my own observation, as limited as that is, as evidence uh, suggests to me 
that those kids will have an access to resource that's important. And I'll close with this comment. I just, it was mentioned in the staff report, but I just want to say it publicly. Um, my thanks and the thanks to my constituents and my fellow counselors, I'm sure would join in this, uh, to Councillor Coyne, uh, my predecessor in District 5, interrupted. Um, he can't be here this evening, but uh, John put a lot of work into the task force on athletic fields. And sometimes you plant a tree and he actually gets to sit in the shade of that tree. Uh, he started this in 2011. So, so sometimes good ideas take a while to mature and find the right variables all coming together. So he's out of town. I let him know this was happening. He was thrilled. Um, 2011 is ancient history right now for some of us. But uh, for him, it's an opportunity to see the future realized. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dion. Uh, Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a few comments, but I, I wanted to start um, with a couple of uh, quick questions, if possible. Um, not sure who's most um, equipped or, or appropriate to answer, but I, I did want to uh, ask a couple of the questions or how to yeah, ask a couple of the questions that uh, Mr. Rowe um, sent us. Um, I guess um, I am intrigued to find uh, a little bit of information about the 10 acre parcel that city owned. Uh, it, I believe from what I saw on the map uh, that Mr. Rowe sent us, it, it is directly adjacent to the, to the park uh, project. So does the city ever, is that number one, is that parcel ever been assessed for development? Number two, is there plans uh, if it's not plan to be developed um, to work into this park project. Uh, and I'll stop there. I'll, I'll have follow ups after that. Thank you, Councilor. I'm going to ask uh, Director Hipple if you wouldn't mind uh, responding to that question, please. Yeah, I think uh, Councilor Rodriguez is referring to 1743 Washington. And um, we are very familiar with this property. I've walked it uh, by myself with my staff. Uh, I One of my duties is to sit on the tax acquired property um, committee, which is a collection of city staff that makes recommendations to the city manager who brings um, things to the council about what to do with uh, tax acquired properties. And some of these, um, uh, the tax acquired property committee also looks at properties that aren't tax acquired, ju uh, just like what to do uh, with certain city properties. So I've walked this uh, for that purpose. And uh, that property that um, Councilor Rodriguez is referring to is pretty wet or it's very wet, it's uh, a lot of wetlands. So if we were to take this and build a athletic facility there, for instance, we'd have to fill a lot of wetlands, cut down a lot of trees. So when we walked it, we didn't see a lot of park opportunities there for this type of recreation. The, um, the parcel we're proposing for a park includes a field that's already built. We don't need to cut down trees or fill wetlands. And it also provides all those open spaces, trails and vernal pools and all that the natural pieces as well. Um, the, I can say that the committee uh, has, you know, there, there's a lot of work that staff does and we do look for opportunities where parcels could be marketed for housing. So we've been working with housing and economic development director on that Washington Ave property for opportunities for housing. So these are the kind of things that happen and that, that filter their way up and sometimes they take a while but that are in progress, so. Great, thank you, Ethan, that's helpful. Yeah. On, the, on that same uh, note, I appreciate that in the parcel that we are talking about that there aren't wetlands that need to be filled. Um, is there, however, any drainage work that needs to happen? Um, similar to, I guess, like what Mr. Rowe was referring to that did take place over at the Lysis and Lamar Moore fields. Yeah, there's nothing we're aware of. Um, you know, we're doing due diligence with the Trust for Public Land right now and getting environmental surveys and reports. The athletic field that's at um, the North Deering Park location, uh, it's currently used as an athletic field, so it's privately owned, but they let Little League play there on occasion and some high school play here and there. So it's, it's a usable field. Could it use improvements? It probably could, and we're planning on that. Um, over time, uh, and there's a um, you know campaign to also raise uh, funds for development of this park and improvements 
Uh, when I say development, I mean, I'm saying, you know, improving what's already there. So the walking trails, the parking lot, the athletic facility. Uh, and just to clarify, we're not planning on filling any wetlands at this new facility. If we were to, the, the property on Washington, the 1743 Washington Avenue would require filling wetlands to build the equivalent kind of facilities. Great, great. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, that's also really helpful. Um, I guess my uh, next, just, I guess a couple of comments. Number one, I am going to uh, to be supporting this and I'm actually very excited about this project. Um, I, I did want to speak a little bit about the, I guess the, the, the totality of, of what we're doing, because this project and this particular, you know, assessing how this advances equitable access to green spaces um, throughout the city, you know, this isn't the only thing that's happening in the city. So, so it's, it, if we right now, and I had the great pleasure late last week, uh, right before I went out on my trip, um, I had to do a, a tour, several community gardens with some parks department staff because of uh, several infrastructure improvements that are going to be taking place. And um, almost at every site, um, some of this included Valley Street Garden, Payson Park. Uh, we went over to North Street. We went over to uh, Boyd Street, which is not right next to Kennedy Park. And um, almost at every site, there was some sort of adjacent project that was happening, like literally, uh, you know, a stone's throw away that the park staff were talking, oh yeah, there's gonna be either a new playground out here in Valley Street, or there's gonna be, you know, there's so much going on, particularly this year, and there's funding that's coming from all sorts of, for, of um, sources. So yes, if we look at this in a vacuum, it, it starts to look like, you know, wow, what has traditionally been an affluent part of town and we're adding this, um, but number one, it's not what it has traditionally been. Uh, I know I moved in there about 10 years ago to North Earing and I've seen it change. Um, and I, by the way, I'm different than what used to be there too. So I hope to change it. <laughs> um, and again, just being aware of what's happening throughout the city, you know, there's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot to be proud of, of how we're advancing uh, the equitable access to green spaces and keeping green spaces available under such a pressure of development. So again, there's a lot for us to appreciate of what's going on through the parks department. I just wanted to put that out there. And then the last thing that I wanted to say, um, just in case I don't have a chance to speak later today, just want to give the mayor uh, kudos for the swift uh, Zoom navigating when we had that really um, unfortunate and inappropriate speaker um, try to sneak uh, some really uh, unfortunate comments here. So thank you, mayor, for being so quick. Uh, with the computer, regardless of some uh, you know, technology uh, difficulties mm -hmm. earlier. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rodriguez. Um, tonight's been an adventure in a variety of ways. Um, further council conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Ali, you've got a hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I too do plan to uh, support uh, this uh, item. I have a question. I think I had a, a Ethan, uh, Mr. Hippel did mention something like task acquired committee. How are people appointed to that committee? Hi, Councillor Ali. Um, this is uh, the city manager. There is um, it's a staff, their staff, it's a staff committee. It's not a council committee. So it's one that advises um, the city manager on the various properties. Um, there's a whole uh, host of things that they look at and a variety of rules that they apply. Um, I know Michael, I believe uh, it sits on that as well. Maybe can provide some more details, um, but there is a, a lot of specific items that are put there and there are specific departments that are involved uh, across the board that look at the various properties that we have that become tax acquired, but Michael can fill in some gaps. Yeah, I can ju I just add that it, um, uh, the committee deals with tax acquired properties, but also other city owned properties um, that were acquired in ways other than through the uh, tax lien foreclosure process. Um, the rules that govern the uh, the committee are have been approved by uh, by the council. Um, I think the last one was it was it was a few years ago, I think. But um, uh, there are certain um, certain properties that. Uh, depending on the size and nature of the property that um, the city council through the uh, through the approval of those rules has authorized the city manager to uh, review for uh, for sale or other disposition. Um, and I think that that about sums it up. I mean, the, the rules themselves are fairly detailed, but 
um, but it is, as as uh, the city manager explained, a, a staff uh, committee. Yeah, so uh, mem all members of this committee are staff, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. That is all I want to know. Uh, and thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Good to see you. Other comments from the council discussion? I appreciate everybody's input tonight. I um, I just want to take an opportunity to thank all this all the all the parties that have come together. Um, so of course I'm going to start with our own parks department. I think we have um, the best. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, we uh, I, I know that open space in Portland is such an important asset, and we have an incredible parks and recreation staff that keeps spaces. Um, usable and friendly and safe um, and, and fun. So thank you uh, to our own parks department. Um, we've also got the Land Bank Commission and the Parks Conservancy and the Parks Commission and the Trust for Public Land coming together. So this demonstration of partnership and collaboration I think is one to note and celebrate and thank um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work that you do to bring, bring these things forward. Um, and I will be um, happy to support it this evening. Without further discussion, we can go ahead and vote on order 135. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chabarro? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 135 passes unanimously. Again, thank you to everybody who came um, to, to support this, this process this evening and provide additional information. We'll move on to our orders now. Will the clerk please read order 141. Order 141, 22, 23, approving the memorandum of understanding for mutual aid with the city of Westbrook, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Uh, do you want to say, that I, say go, go, you go ahead. I was going to say, chief is here and I know he's been waiting <laughs> patiently for us. So I, I, I don't know if you have anything you want to specifically add on this item. Um, not really. This is really a formality. Um, we do mutual aid with all communities around us, uh, and we can do that under Maine state statute. This really was, we were approached by the Westbrook chief because they're, they're going for a, uh, an accreditation. So it's just a formality. Thank you, chief. Um, I also want to tee up um, so that folks in the community who may want to offer public comment on this know that there is a prepared amendment in the backup materials. So at the appropriate time, I'll offer the amendment to 141 that's in the backup. It's language that was offered by staff as this uh, action was prepared. So I um, want to draw attention to that before we move to public comment, which we will do now. So I will look to folks in chambers or on Zoom who would like to offer a comment on order 141. I have a hand up on Zoom, um, not identified by a name, but a phone number, 215-520. Um, go, go ahead and let us know your name and, and uh, the neighborhood you live in or the organization that you represent, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, good. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys if you know the what Kiwi Farms is doing for your community. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, other public comment on order 141. In chambers on Zoom, I see none. I'm gonna close public comment on order 141 and I'm gonna come back to the council um, for a motion, please. So moved. Second, Councillor Ali with second from Councillor Fournier. And if you will indulge me, I'll dive right into the amendment that's been prepared and offered for you um, in the backup. So it is um, some strike and replace language as well as additional language that was added to the memorandum of understanding between the city of Westbrook and the city of Portland. So I'll offer this, um, make a motion to amend order 141 to include the amendment contained in our packet. And I look for a second. Second. Councillor Zaro with the second. Is there any, are there any questions on the amendment? Okay, I think it's pretty straightforward. It was just a last minute language um, addition. So uh, seeing no uh, questions from the council, we'll go ahead and vote on the amendment. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevorrow? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. 
Okay, now we're back to order 141 as amended. Is there any council conversation about order 141? I, I will say that I, I paused here and asked a couple of questions as the agenda was being planned because I know we do mutual aid, but I hadn't seen an MOU before. So I was grateful for the backup and the explanation about oh, the credentialing that uh, Westbrook is looking to do, but it sounds like it's also a benefit to do this and to make clear um, the, the roles that we, that we play and the partnership that we have with one another. So I appreciate this being before us tonight. Happy to approve it. And I think we can go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 141, as amended, passes unanimously. Thank you, Chief, for sticking with us. Will the clerk please read order 142. Order 142, 22, 23, accepting the 2022 annual land bank report sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Where'd he go? I'm not sure where Ethan is, but is there, are you, I, I was thinking that you're here for the, the presentation. So feel free to come up and if you have a, a brief introduction to the item, that'd be great. Yes, good evening. Again, John Cashmar uh, from the Land Bank Commission. I do have a brief PowerPoint, but I'm going to spare you that because of the technical issues. I don't want to burden the great IT staff here anymore, um, and I don't think it's necessary. I'm glad to um, take questions after. I wanted to give a brief summary of our work in 2022, as we're obligated to do, but more importantly, would rather um, let you know in person what, what we're up to and, and give you some, some of that. Um, and again, glad to take questions, et cetera. Just really quickly, uh, as a reminder, I like to um, keep in mind the um, uh, responsibilities of the land bank, because I think it's important to keep on mission. I'm gonna quickly read that. The land bank commission is responsible for identifying and protecting open space resources within the city of Portland. The commission seeks to preserve a balance between development and conservation of open space, important for wildlife, uh, ecological, environmental, scenic, and outdoor recreation values. Um, if I were to show you a presentation, we'd have a map. We have an increasing map of uh, land bank properties and open space around the city. Uh, as you heard earlier, we continue to strive to get better about equity and access for everyone for our land bank properties, just like we do for parks. Um, we also um, continue to um, consider housing because we know that's important. We live here too, and we understand that on the land bank commission. We do have some properties that we have uh, passed on because we think they would be better for economic development or housing. We have one we're currently working on, we're considering some lots. So it, it is an important topic for us. And when, when this uh, opportunity arises and we feel it's right, we have uh, done that and will continue to look for those sorts of opportunities again for equity and housing for sure. Just quickly, you heard about the North Deering Park. That's been front and center for us. I won't speak more to that. Uh, we recently added, um, as you may recall, um, in, an acre, but a mighty acre to the Riverton Trolley Park, um, which has values to the Presumpscot River from a water quality perspective, also has scenic and historic values to that park and that neighborhood. We continue to work on Redlawn Woods in the Rosemont area. Um, this is a, I always forget, six to eight acre, but again, an important property that's been used by residents and continues um, to be used and uh, complicated, but we continue to work on that as a priority. We've also been focused on trail maintenance. Um, we funded a six person field team for two weeks of trail maintenance at Riverton Trolley Park again, three person field team uh, and materials for a week at Persomscot River Preserve. We've done this in conjunction with uh, the Parks Department, um, who I agree with earlier comments, has really uh, been outstanding working with and an incredible uh, partner with, with the Land Bank. And um, re really, uh, we wouldn't be doing it without them for sure. Um, our, our properties are typically uh, un... Um, uh, facilitated in that we don't really have anything on them. They're typically a fairly modest trail that allows you to get onto the property, allows you to see the uh, natural and ecological value, uh, the spiritual value, whatever that may represent for you of undeveloped areas. 
Um, and, and that's uh, what we continue to strive for. We do have some hybrids in cases. North Daring is another good example. But again, those undeveloped spaces, whether they be part of a bigger project or on their own, um, really the focus of our work. I also wanted to mention Portland Trails. Portland Trails uh, continues to be a significant partner on our land bank properties in terms of uh, maintaining trails, signage, uh, navigating around the city by trail, connecting trails. I know they uh, also are a major partner with the city for parks as well as our land bank properties, uh, but kudos to them and we continue to have a really strong relationship. Just lastly, I wanted to mention uh, what's on tap for 2023. I've given you 2022 uh, annual report, but 2023, um, we continue to work on acquisition in the Coolidge and Davenport lots. These are in North Deering as well. Um, these are one of the areas where there may be some uh, potential development opportunity that we may pass on in a, in a combination of land bank and other properties for other uses. Um, North Deering Park, you know, um, completing Red Lawn, as I mentioned. We're also working on a potential hand carry access point on Hobart Street, which gives access to the Four River. We don't have a lot of river front access. Uh, this would be across from the airport and, and a great opportunity to do that. Um, we're updating our high priority parcel list. We obviously have criteria and keep that updated as to what's important or not and continue to work on that. Trail improvements, as I mentioned, wayfinding, maintenance, all those sorts of things that are happening behind the scenes. The green space gathering with the Parks Commission, uh, we are a partner on that and participate and uh, promote it. And we'll do that again. And then finally, um, we continue to field proposals to the Land Bank Commission from community members. We're getting increasing uh, input and comments from community members, which is great in terms of possible parcels, why we're doing one thing over another in that, in that regular engagement. So um, I just wanted to note that as well. Again, thank you for the um, consistent support from the um, City Council for our work. It's always helpful um, to be constructive and supportive while at the same time asking hard questions and we and we welcome those. And uh, with that, I will stop. Well, thank you very much for being here. And John, as you mentioned, you're not only a, mention of, uh, a member of the Land Bank Commission, but also of the Parks um, Commission as well. So thank you for your service. Um, and stick around in case there are questions for you. But um, as we head into um, this action, we'll first go to public comment. So if you're here in council chambers and you'd like to offer public comment on the 2022 annual land bank report, we welcome that. Um, so go ahead and step to the mic and then we'll transfer over to Zoom where we've got a couple of hands up. Uh, George Rowe, uh, West Bayside. Um, I'm an honorary member of the land bank. Um, it's kind of a, probably an inside joke that uh, I am like a, a Zelig character in their little photos because I'm literally the only person and you have to actually have money and time to even follow what they do um, because virtually I would say 99% of this city of 68,000 plus people have no idea this thing even exists. And the only people who do are people who directly benefit from the nimbyism that it's basically been conducting for the last 20 years. I just want to remind the council that you, for years, have made council goals around housing and homelessness. In the last three years in particular, you've emphasized it in sort of almost hysterical fashion, how important those council goals are for your work year. And yet year after year for the past three years, literally all you've done is hoover up dozens and dozens of acres of mostly developable land. And again, the wetlands excuse is an excuse. If you look around, uh, whenever someone wants to fill in some wetlands, it happens. It only doesn't happen when someone's like, oh, we really need, we can't have housing there. Um, just for example, there used to be a wetland literally right on this, down this hill. It's gone now. It's like, you know, underground sewer stuff, culverts, whatever. It just dribbles into the harbor. But in an urban environment, you have to disturb wetlands and you have to disturb things sometimes. And the reason you do that is so you don't have to spend, say, $50 million in Wyndham protecting Lake Sebago Lake from 
septic service, which is exactly what the Portland Water District is doing right now. And my water rates are probably going up because of that. Why? Because we pushed literally thousands of people to Wyndham in other suburbs beyond Portland in the last 20 years through things like the land bank. The land bank is basically what you do when there's a famine and people who can afford food are running around grabbing what's little of that food is left and then sitting back and saying, well, hey, look, people got to eat, you know, and that's the excuse you keep making year after year after year. And you empower a group of affluent homeowners. 30 second warning. To hoover up land and you don't empower really anybody else in this town unless they're an affordable housing developer and making millions of dollars from it to do anything similar for housing. And you wonder why you're creating all this artificial scarcity, and you wonder why you have people sleeping on your sidewalks night after night after night. You caused this problem, and now you're cheerleading it, and you don't even really understand that connection. Or you do, and Thank it's shameless that you don't make that connection clear. Thank you. Any other comments on the 2022 annual land bank report? We've got a couple hands up on Zoom and we're uh, uh, there's a phone number here listed first. Uh, Jessica, if you can hear me, it's a 215 number. Again, comments specific to the land bank's annual report, please. And if Hi, you will, how's please... it going? Hi there, can you give us your name, uh, first and last name and the neighborhood you live in? Yeah, this is John Smith from Bayside. Um, so I, I was just calling in to, um, I, I was going to ask you guys, uh, what's your stance on Israel? Okay. Uh, next, we'll go to John Ashley. Hi. Why is the uh, free okay, speech okay. section not part of the public comment? Okay, thank you. We're taking public comment right now on the 2022 annual land bank report. We do take public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda at the beginning of the meeting that happened at five o'clock. Um, seeing no further uh, public comment um, coming forward on order 142, I'll close public comment and come back to the council, please, for a motion to approve receipt of the annual report. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Fournier. And I'm looking to the council to see if there's any discussion on the land bank report as submitted. Okay, um, seeing none again, John, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for the summary report is in the backup materials, links to maps and other resources within that report. So uh, have a read if you're, um, if you're interested. Um, it's a wealth of information. Thank you again. And thank you for the work that you do. We'll go ahead and vote on acceptance of that report. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Acceptance is unanimous. Thank you. Will the clerk please read order 143? Order 143, 22, 23, approving the Winchester Woods Boundary Line Agreement, sponsored by Michael Goldman, Associate Corporate Counsel. Looking at you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this just uh, just to clarify, any potential confusion doesn't have anything to do with the Winchester Woods issues that have been discussed, the funding issues over the last uh, uh, couple months. This um, it's the same it's the same property, um, but the purpose of this order is to approve a boundary line agreement to clarify some old title concerns um, that. Uh, uh, that are required by the um, by the planning board for approval of the um, uh, the subdivision, um, and so the the agreement establishes, I think, essentially the uh, the boundary line that has been observed by uh, by the city uh, and the neighbor for for years. Um, but this will be recorded in the registry of deeds to clarify exactly where the where the boundary line is. I know that um, Mike Murray, public works director, is on the call. If there are other questions about it, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the agreement itself. Um, and if there are questions about sort of the use of the property, I think that uh, Mike can jump in. Okay, doke. Thank you so much for that sure. um, overview. It's a fairly straightforward um, action with great backup in the council's agenda. Um, at this point, we will take public comment on Order 143. 
I don't see anybody stepping forward in chambers. I do have a hand up um, from Zoom, Larry Cuckman to address the boundary line agreement, um, order 143. Hello. Hello, do you hear me? We hear you. Yep, if you could give us your first and last name, the neighborhood you live in or, and the organization you represent and you've got three minutes on the clock. Hello, I am Larry Cuckman from the East Bay, and I'd like to know why are y'all having a secret meeting okay, after okay, thank the you. completely closes down? Nope, it's not a secret meeting. Okay. <laughs> Any other public comment? Concerned American on Zoom. Uh, again, we are addressing Order 143, the Winchester Woods Boundary Line Agreement. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Um, I would just like to remind you that you're. If you not can please give us your name, first and last name, as well as the neighborhood that you live in. Session that under Statute One, Title One, Section Four Hundred Five of the thank Main. You. Thank you. Okay, I will close public comment on Order One Forty Three and come back to the Council for a motion. Nope. Yep. One Forty Three. Council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second. Okay. Councillor Zaro with a second from Councillor Fournier. Any council discussion? Okay, we can go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 143 passes unanimously. Will the clerk please read? Order 144. Order 144, 22, 23, accepting and appropriating a $10,000 anonymous donation to the National EMS Appreciation Week Fund, sponsored by Danielle West, Interim City Manager. This is the last item the chief is here for this evening. Did you want to give a little background on this? Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Related to the wonderful recognition that you read earlier, uh, uh, some folks wanted to show their appreciation, and this is how they did it, uh, it is, is by a donation uh, to the fire department. Um, and, and specifically, I was able to have coffee with them and, and, and told, told them where this money was actually going to go towards. Um, and for the last four years, uh, there's a week in May that's called National EMS Appreciation Week. Um, that we, uh, for four straight days, we cook all of our providers lunch, we do raffles, we, we just, we try, we try to do as much as we can for them with the, with the limited budget constraints that we have. Uh, so this is perfect timing for this, because uh, the every bit of this money will go towards that week. And we aim to make that week the biggest and best that we've done for our, for our uh, providers. Um, and there might be an opportunity for the donors to meet all of the providers. So not only did we show appreciation for the fine men and women that you mentioned earlier, this will be able to touch all of our firefighters. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. So appreciate your support. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to comment on this, but first we'll see if there's any public comment on Order 144. I, there is not. I will close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. Uh, Mayor, there's a hunt up. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Councillor uh, Ali. I think it shot up after I closed public comment, but go ahead, Tina. We're taking public comment on Order 144. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Our rights trump your feelings. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. I public comment is closed on order 144 and I ask the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Is that Councillor Zaro with a second from Councillor Ali? And I look to the council for any discussion. There may be on order 144. Chief, thanks again for your comments and for the context, the additional context there. It's a wonderful gift. And um, I, I am very eager to support it and show appreciation to the donor for uh, not only for the donation, but for their recognition of the great work that uh, the men and women of the fire department do here in the city of Portland. We can go ahead and vote on order 144. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. 
Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Zaro. Yes. Councilor Trevorrow. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes, uh, that order passes unanimously. And at this point in time, I'm gonna look for a motion to adjourn the regular meeting of the city council in order that we go into an executive session um, pursuant to one MRSA section 4056E to discuss the city's legal rights and duties concerning the first amendment. Um, is there a motion to adjourn the regular meeting and go into executive session? So, so moved. Second. Councillor Dion with a second from Councillor Rodriguez. Um, is there any public comment on this motion? I see no nobody stepping forward in chambers. I do see a few hands up on uh, Zoom. So again, this is uh, specific to the council's motion to adjourn and go into executive session. First, we go to Maynard. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, I just want to say, um, Again, fuck just a, just fuck a reminder. Ju okay. Just a reminder for those folks who are interested in offering public comment, we ask for your first and last name, uh, your address, the neighborhood you live in, or the organization that you represent. So that's consistent with our council rules. I'm happy to take your comment, but please start out with your name, um, identification, and we're talking specifically about our motion to adjourn, concerned American. Uh, who fell off, uh, somebody named Samuel Hyde. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I just wanted to say, uh, well, first, my name's Chuck Sneed. I own Sneed's Feed and Seed on uh, Ocean Street. And I'd like to start by addressing uh, City Manager Daniel West by uh, just saying how much of a pleasure it was seeing him at Blackstone's on uh, Pine Street. Okay. Um, we're talking about our motion to adjourn into executive session. Uh, next, somebody has failed to put their name, but we can go to our next caller. Please give us your name first and last. Hi, have I understood correctly that this is about the- Hi, can we please have your name first and last name? Hey, yes, my name is Jason Pollock. And what neighborhood do you live in? Um, I, may I decline to answer on the basis of remaining anonymous? Well, our council rules call for, if not your address, your neighborhood, or the organization that you represent. Um, I live south of Portland. Is that close enough? Go ahead. Okay. Are we? Do I understand correctly that this is about the First Amendment uh, issue, or is it? Are we moving into that? Uh, we're motion. We have a motion to adjourn the regular meeting and go into executive session. Okay. So, it, it, is this where I would comment on the "it's okay to be white" issue? This is where you would comment on the motion to adjourn and go into executive session. Okay, then I have not understood correctly. I'll raise my hand later. Thank you. Next is Chad Chesterfield. Okay, um, we can move past that. We can't, if you're, are you with us, Chad? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about yeah, yeah. This is Chad Chesterfield there. I'm just from uh, St. Paris there down down under. Um, before we I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, I'm from the St. Parish. Um, I, I just wanted to um touch on something we were we were talking about the uh, the sea dogs a little bit earlier. We're not is talking it, about that right now. We're talking about our motion to adjourn the regular meeting and go into executive. I, I'm I'm aware that we're talking about that. However, I disagree. I would like to dispute the motion to adjourn the meeting because I have something I would like to discuss about the sea dogs. I'm sorry. We, um, we that was we were taking public comment when we were taking up that issue. I'm, we're not doing it at this at this time. Okay. Next is Connor. Oh, hey, can y'all hear me? Uh, yes. Please give us your first and last name and the neighborhood that you're from. Yeah, uh, my name's Connor Clark uh, from the East Bay. Um, yeah, I think it's a horrible idea to uh, go into executive meeting if it's not going to be public where we can all hear it. Uh, you know, it's a First Amendment issue. Uh, it, that seems, uh, you know, pretty relevant that uh, everyone should be able to hear it. 
So yeah, that's, that's my only comment there. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I'm gonna close public comment um, on that uh, motion to adjourn the regular meeting and go into executive session. Um, is there any council comment? Okay, we have the motion before us from Councillor Dion, seconded by Councillor Rodriguez, and we'll go ahead and vote um, to leave council chambers in order to go into room 209 for uh, once we've adjourned into the executive session. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chabarro? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.